you've tuned into Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, a video podcast series. Our episode starts right now. Here's your host, Dominique Vale. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, where you can check in for your dose of stigma-breaking, humor-filling, motivation-loving life hacks, and empowering tips for all the medically adultish people in life. I'm Dominique Vale, founder of Invisive Charity and your host for Invisive Chat Sessions. And today is season five, episode 66. And it is a real treat for not only you, but for me as well, because our special guest is not only someone that I'm a fan of, but someone who makes excellent meals that would also be a treat for you. So I did plan that pun in advance. Um, (laughs) It would be the award-winning home cook, TV personality, writer, and creator of Dish It Girl, Dina Delisa Gonzar. <laughs> now, as a fellow New Jersey Italian, I have to point that out because I never get those moments yeah. for me. Dina creates recipes that fuse her family traditions with a modern twist, making the prospect of having fun in the kitchen approachable and empowering for her over 129,000 followers on oh, Instagram. Geez. Um, and beyond. Um, With her initial background being in a different career path of being a school counselor, Dina's education background gives her an advantage in the kitchen, making her steps of following recipes conversational for everyone to follow along. And I also have to mention that my first introduction to Dina might have been on a little reality show called Married to Jonas, but I will just let you guys deep dive on the internet to know what that means if you don't (laughs) off the top of your head. Uh, Dina has such a bright personality that has made her on television and online a fantastic home cook. She's been on the Today Show, Guys Grocery Games, The Good Dish, Rachel Ray Online, just to name a few. And Dina shares her recipes and her conversations about family and life on her platform. She also uses her voice to really connect with other young people and fellow parents, being really open and honest in the journey of having postpartum depression, talking about anxiety and empowering yourself to keep growing and becoming the best version you can be. So Dina, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. I should hire you as my PR person. (laughs) Thank you so much for that generous introduction. That was so nice. (laughs) <laughs> of course hey, you can clip that and use it in your in your for real sure, you for sure. I am happy to be here with you today Dominique I mean I appreciate everything that you know your charity does and that you've set out to do so I think you guys deserve the real praise here <laughs> oh, thank you so much and I'm so excited like I said to have you on our episode today and as always I will remind everyone if you can to subscribe to the Invisible chat sessions you can give it a like, thumbs up, positive comment, and make sure you watch the full episode. At the end, we're going to get talking about cooking with Dina, so make sure you stay until the very end to get all of your cooking feelings out and get those tips from Dina. So we're going to jump right into a different segment, though, called Path to Power. Path to Power. Power. Our Path to Power segment, as usual, is about owning who you are and the lane that you have created for yourself in life. So today, Dina and I are going to be discussing how to create your path to power within yourself when you are being your own boss, both in and out of the professional setting. So I even just from reading your bio, it's clear that calling you a multi-hyphenated entrepreneur is is a clear statement so for you what is one of the most appealing things about being your own boss and being in charge of your work schedule um I think where it really stemmed from was I I wanted to uh in thinking of family planning for me um I really wanted to do something that would allow me to be home with my daughter as much as possible it really wasn't about um trying to subscribe to hustle culture or to make lots of money. I just saw the opportunity to be able to use what I was already doing in the home and that I was passionate about every single day. And um, it, it seemed that that was making an impact outside of my own little kitchen. And I just kind of took it step by step. I didn't jump in and dive in with um some huge business plan. Um, I really learned a lot along 
the way. And and the first jobs that came to me were recipe testing, um, recipe creation. And those were things actually, even before I had Sienna that I was doing that after work, I would come home, um, when I was school counselor, I was cooking for Brian. (laughs) So I just kind of, I took what was already going on in my everyday life and, uh, just kind of turned it into a business there. (laughs) That's how it happened. (laughs) No. And I I love that because like you had mentioned that you worked in schools and were in the education Mm -hmm. system, but so was there a, besides, so the catalyst really was for you about with you and Brian, with your daughter now Sienna, but having building that, expanding that family for yourselves and wanting. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that opportunity. And at the time, um, I had been a school counselor and working in the schools for a couple of years. And I noticed that work was picking up um, through this small business that I didn't know I was starting. And um, the way things were going um, in the school system that I was at, it was kind of that point where I was like, wow, I could um, step away from this and and take a beat and um, kind of just reassess um, what's going on here in, in my life, you know, that big moment. And I was like, you know, I'm only putting, you know, not even 50% of my time into what was becoming Disha girl. And I'm not a huge risk taker. I'll tell you that I'm very safe and planned, but I just felt like God was like, this is the right time. He's like, I'm putting these opportunities in front of you. I know it's scary to leave your job. I didn't have children at the time. And I was like, wow, what if I could build this up a little bit, see what it would look like. And for all I know in the future, it could give me the flexibility um, to be at home a little bit more. So I went for it. <laughs> no, I'm, and I'm so glad that you did, because it's also like you said, especially in a lot of people who are in the education system in all capacities, it's such it can become a taxing because you're working, sure. you're doing your work with other colleagues, but then you're also really indebted to sure. the other kids you're working with as well. Um, sure. So do you, have you ever felt that there were experiences from doing your education background and doing school counseling that you think have made the transition into Dish It Girl and your work in cooking easier or that you kind of apply things that you did naturally as a counselor into your yeah. work now? 100%. Um, I think that a lot of the children that I met with um, served as inspiration um, as I started out. And even as I move forward now, I became more of an advocate through the years mm-hmm. um, for family dinner and just um, encouraging people to gather together. A lot of the kids I met with um, during my years counseling, um, which I did, I really truly I truly loved. I mean, that and the school system is a whole nother conversation, <laughs> another, like another day and like hats off to all educators because um, they are working truly hard in some really mm-hmm. rough circumstances most of the time. So, you know, my little plug there for te- teachers, be good to your teachers. <laughs> um, and so I noticed a lot of the students that were coming into me, uh, some of some of the the basic issue was they really just wanted more time with that caregiver, that adult, that person in their life. And I could see how the breakdown of the family system of people just not just being way too busy to spend time, FaceTime with each other. You know, a lot of parents um, being surprised by what is going on or not knowing how to talk to their children about what was going on. And I just realized that, wow, um, that face-to-face time with your children or your family is becoming less and less of, of, of the norm. So I found that encouraging others to like, you can get your family together for dinner and it doesn't have to be fancy or Pinteresty, um, but however you choose to do it, whether it's, you know, pouring a bowl of cereal or, you know, making toast, or even if you are ordering pizza, if you're making a point to sit together and just connect, that's going to go a long, a long way. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think I I love that you said that because I know my sister um, is a special education teacher in kindergarten right now. And Mm -hmm. so um, it's there's this even she's newly married, but even she makes such an intention her and my brother in law that when she comes home, no matter if it's late from her tutoring until 7pm, even just their own small family is always just he'll either cook 
dinner for them or she'll oh. come home if it's earlier and it's just making sure that the two of them get to have that time or when they get to she'll she'll tell me I wasn't saying she was expanding her family they have a puppy coming in a couple weeks so oh. technically they will be a family of three I, yeah for <laughs> sure for sure it's just it for sure is intentionality and yeah. I think people should be applauded for that too it's not something that's going to get you on an Instagram platform but that's what I'm saying your your every day you think it's mundane and you think it's just no big deal but it actually is a really big deal because you look at my mom now who should be an empty nester, but we're all knocking on her door, all four of us, you know, every weekend she can't get rid of us. But, <laughs> you know, that's the nice thing. People are like, how is your family still wanting to get together? How are they still together? And I really think it's the work that she put in in creating family boundaries. Um, and, you know, things just get busier and busier as time goes on. You know, kids are in more and more extracurricular activities, which are great but I do see the disintegration of family boundaries playing into the breakdown of communication. And that's, that's not always the best. I don't, I, you know, I don't think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And especially with us working with teens and young adults, that <laughs> definitely is um, something we'll always mention is how much time are you guys speaking to family or friends or yeah. having, even if you can't do it every day of the week and you set aside time even once a week while you're in university or traveling for work yeah. to just, set yeah. up that chat time with family or friends yeah. that are your network to kind yeah. of give you that support system um, that you wouldn't naturally have in different chapters of your life because you'll be yes. busy or changing things. Yeah, 100%. Um, and even kind of going off of that, I know something we hear with a lot of the young people we have at our charity is a lot of chronically ill and disabled young people are often encouraged to become entrepreneurs. So they're not in the structure of a typical nine to five that might not be flexible mm -hmm. or adaptive for their accessibility needs that they might yeah. have, whatever mm -hmm. they are. Um, but have you found things that have worked for you as pieces of advice of you building your own schedule and being that you're not working in someone else's structure, that you're the one that has to kind of tailor the day and the weeks for yourself? Yeah. I mean, first of all, make sure you're finding whatever it is you're choosing to do. Make sure it's something that you truly like to do. I mean, if you're going to make up your own career, you might as well <laughs> make sure it's something you you like and you really have to guard yourself against burnout. So I think when you're working for yourself, it's very easy to fall into that working 24-7 because, okay, well, I don't have to work nine to five. So then you start finding yourself, you know, working at night, working on Saturdays, working on Sundays, because you're starting to spread your calendar out all over the place. And then you do, you fall into this trap. Well, not only are you, maybe you're not working nine to five per se, but you're, you're putting yourself in a 24 seven <laughs> cycle. Um, so I would say first thing, cause I burnt myself out real quick, um, many, many times over again. <laughs> so um, I do think that you have to set some boundaries for yourself in terms of like, yeah, I could answer this email at 1030 at night, but maybe I shouldn't. Now for me, when I was a new mom and such, yes, it was working for me to answer my emails between eight and 10 o'clock at night, not expecting others to be up and doing the same. But during the day, I was really occupied with Sienna. So, you know, that became my thing, but, um, and then some people like to wake up really early and do that whole thing. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> I can't, I can't do that, but I think it's also take, so it's making sure you're choosing something that you love to do and then taking stock of the season you're in within your, mm -hmm. your life, you know, art, art, do you have kids? Do you not have kids? Are you married? Are you single? Like what is going on? What kind of time constraints do you have as it is. So I'll just use myself as an example. Sienna's in kindergarten. So now I try to do most of my work in between nine and three. And so I really work hard to make sure I don't step into the trap of um, running too many errands during that time. Cause you can fill your, also as an entrepreneur, you have that freedom with your time. It is very easy to mm -hmm. spend way too much time in target running errands <laughs> Or my problem was I kept like cleaning everything and not working. So I had to say, all right, between nine and three, I I work. That's when I try to get my recipes done. That's when I try to 
cook for the blog or um, cook for a client, um, do the social media thing. And then, you know, after she goes to bed, I'll spend an hour just kind of like cleaning up, I say, just and setting my schedule for the next day. That's been a real game changer using whatever you're comfortable using. I use Google Calendar and I make sure that the night before I've already put in tasks for the day because it's very easy to get distracted. It's very easy to forget um, what it is that you need to do. So I do make sure that every night I take a second just to make sure I know what I'm doing at least in the morning um, and then then shut it shut it down if I can. Yeah. And I like how you said really take stock of where you're at in life, because that really does evolve even year by year of what with new jobs or old, or if you're taking on different projects at different yeah. times, really seeing what would work best for, for you. And that really can help lower the the stress or anxiety you'll feel at different points of I've I mean I've been running in busy youth it'll be almost eight years next month and so um it's aged me um but uh <laughs> yeah. I still look as young as I did when I launched the thing so my poor volunteers you have to are... think of your energy levels and yeah. your health it depends oh, on yeah. what you're dealing with like are you better in the morning so you know mm-hmm. that you have three four hours in the morning where cognitively I'm doing well and whatnot and then, you know, that's, that's, that's it. Like, that's what I'm saying about seasons. I know I always apply it to maybe where I'm at and being a mom, but even if you have no kids and you're on your own, but that doesn't mean that whatever the next person's doing, doing nine to five or nine to 12 is what's going to work for you because of the way you feel or whatever you're dealing with. Are you not good until the afternoon? You need time to do certain things in the morning to wake up or whatnot. Like that's okay. That's okay. Just whatever structure you choose, try to be consistent with it. Oh yeah. No, definitely. I know that a big deal for me was I started scheduling in what I'll call two sets of flex hours where right in the morning, if I'm having a bad health day or I'm having flare ups in the afternoon, Mm -hmm. I I'm not starting to feel that I'm kind of self-deprecating and getting upset Uh, myself or pushing my schedule. I already know I've allotted two sets of time during the day that I'll have to be flexible. So to me, it becomes less of a, oh, Dominic, you didn't, now you're behind and you didn't do this or that. Now it's like, okay, just take one of your flex hours. You still have another one left. And it's been- That's great. I love that. It's been, that's been the bigger, cause I'll become, I'm so type A, obviously running the charity and wanting it to be good for everyone else. And you work in other countries or a larger audience and you're worrying yeah. about everyone's time zone and what you're doing. So mm-hmm. being able to do things that are good for your needs um, mm-hmm. are, is really valuable. Yes. For sure. And even um, I was going to end on, on that note and then go um, before we went into our next segment, um, kind of going off of that of setting setting aside time for yourself. One of the things that I'll do during those, if I need to just rest and relax is I might check on our Invisi Youth charity shop and see what is going on over there with all of you guys. So um, it will be popping up right next to me. You'll see it. I'm obviously wearing a couple of our wonderful subtle activist color block bracelets that we have in our shop that are handmade by our volunteers um, for all of you. There are $4 with free shipping globally. So 100% of every sale goes directly towards funding our free programs and resources that we put out every month for teens and young adults living with chronic illness and disability. So you get to subtly raise some activism while wearing some handmade jewelry that can be in two different sizes for you and shipped right to your door. So we always say, if you liked the idea of having a Game of Thrones Starbucks cup in the middle of a scene and sparking some curiosity, that's what our bracelets can do for you. Raise some awareness and wear something still chic and um, very minimalist on your wrist. So we have the link to our Etsy store below and popping up on the screen if you would like to add one to your collection or buy one for someone that you care about and raise a little bit of awareness and basically be making a $4 donation to Invisi Youth while you do it. So it's a win-win for everybody if you do that. So thanks if you can check out the shop when you can. And going off of those words about our charity shop, we are going to go into our next segment called First Few Words. First Few Words. (laughs) 
with our first few words segment, you know, we always say that sometimes getting the ball rolling on a conversation is even harder than actually having some conversations. So we are going to have a whole topic of Dina and I really tackling different elements of bringing wellness and mental wellness into your daily structure and routine, and really how we become open and honest with ourselves and those around us to be able to do that. So one of the things I've I've mentioned this to you um, off camera and even now is something I really admire is the way that you bring such a conversational tone of talking about your journey and experience with postpartum depression or if situations in work are bringing anxiety to you, you really present that through your platform in such a conversational approachable way that it feels like such an an easy form of a advocacy for those that are listening and need it but also just in general so kind of on a twofold was there ever a catalyst that made you want to start opening up for yourself personally within your own network about dealing with postpartum or and then kind of then extending that into a public platform I think what it was is I started going down a, a slippery slope of comparison, which, you know, they, they say comparison is the thief of joy. I think when you're sitting by yourself dealing with what you're dealing with and we have social media and different things that we can see everything that's going on with everyone in real time, 24 yeah. seven. And that's something that like maybe my mom or your mom didn't have access to. So it takes whatever we're going through and allows us to exacerbate it even more so. And I would look at other people who had babies around the same time as me in the same kind of um, work environment, I guess you could see. And they just looked so much more functional and like, yeah, like, look, I'm a hot mess. Like I have a messy bun, but I'm glowing. And I was just not that way. I just felt like what happened to me, like I was really functional and now I'm, I don't know what's going on with me. And, and, um, you know, it was really distressing and it was really disheartening and it it was, it was not one other person's fault. It was just, you know, it's just what we have access to. And we also don't know what people have behind the scenes because they're not always sharing, you know, that they they have a nanny or a night nurse or they have this kind of help or their husband's always home or I, I don't even know what it is. They're just making it look like they are thriving on all fronts. Yeah. And then I felt like I am just not, I am just, I'm just not. <laughs> so I never wanted anyone to hop over to my corner of the internet and be made to feel that way. So, and I wanted people to see not only the high points of what I was going through, but the points in between, especially since um, I rely so much on my faith for, um, and, you know, for bringing me through what it is Mm -hmm. that I I go through. Um, And I was like, if I only show people like, oh, this is my victory. and, And this is, you know, where, where it turned good, then they don't know that, Hey, I, you know, I went through low points and I just kept like praying my way through it and, and seeking help and this and that. And these are all the pieces I had to put together to get to that better picture that you're seeing. So I wanted to make that clear. And then I wanted people not to be discouraged with setbacks because you heal, but there's still days where you revisit whether it's your anxiety or your depression, or, you know, even if it's a physical struggle you're having, you know, you make progress, but then there may be days where you're hurting again. And then, you know, I just, I don't want anybody to think that there's never setbacks either. And that you should stop when you have a setback um, or that you shouldn't feel it when you do, you know, so many times we want to cover it up or a rush to pretend it's not, there. So I felt like if, especially being, I guess you would say like a public person, which whether or not I planned on that, I can't fight it anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I don't like it. I don't love it. But I'm like, if I, if I have to do it, I can't do it any other way because I can't fake what's going on here. And then as I did that, the response I got was that so many more people were going through it and either didn't 
weren't able to put words to what they were going through or understand. But when they saw me speak about it or when they saw me go through it, they pinpointed, oh my gosh, this must be it. They were able to go and, and tell their doctor in in words or they were motivated to reach out to get help. So I thought that was a pretty special, special thing. And so I was like, there's no point in in pretending it's it's not going on. I'm not advocating for hot mess mom and I'm not <laughs> advocating for um, you know, Pampers commercial mom. I'm just like every day can be different and it does one day to, it doesn't have to look like someone else's day. So yeah, and I love that because it it's more about you showcasing that having bad moments or, or setback moments during different days or portions don't have to then, a lot of times it can feel like that redefines all of the good days or the good work you've yeah. been putting in and it just starts to completely throw, cast the shadow back and yeah. as if none of that ever happened or never really existed. And that can be challenging especially in in your position of being a new mom or with myself dealing with health issues you're you tend to always put more weight on the bad moments or the setback yeah. moments than all of the days that have just worked and done well for you yeah for sure and i think that's really that's important too especially i what i always will try to tell the younger people at our charity is if you're having stressors, it's a lot of times having health issues. The The focus is on finding the cure in air quotes or trying mm -hmm. to fix certain things and then just completely eliminate them from your life. But the reality is, is that those moments can still pop up. If you're having pristine health, even you might have something that kind of stumbles you back in the middle of it. So it's more about finding things that have worked for you to navigate those flare ups or bad days that you'll have. Yeah. Um, and in, feel empowered to tackle those moments. So have there, what, if, I know you kind of touched on a few of those before, but what were things that you noticed that were working for you in those stages of your time that you were like, oh, these are things that pick, I picked up along the way that were helpful when I was dealing with that? I had to stop telling myself forever and never. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there were days where, um, I would say I would kind of I get on this merry-go-round of saying like things are never going to change. It's always going to be like this. She's always crying. She's always unhappy. I'm never um, dealing with this the right way. Like I would tell myself a lot of like definitive sentences mm -hmm. and I had to notice the way I was like what train I was getting on and I had to get <laughs> and I had to start breaking it down for myself and being like, she's not always like this. This is just a tough moment. And she's just fussy right now. Or today was a tough day, but tomorrow's going to be different. And tomorrow's going to be better. I had to stop myself short hmm. a lot. Um, so I wouldn't slide into that depress depression or that state. I would have to remind myself of the things that did um, go well, or that were going well. And then I also, um, through counseling and such, I learned that I'm a really bad advocate for myself and for what I need. Mm -hmm. um, I feel very funny telling, you know, um, my family, my mom or my husband or my sister, like, hey, I need help with this or I need a break from this. Um, cause I must, I guess I'm used to being the one who helps everyone out and who is there for everyone. And I'm the dependable one, but I was going through a season where I, I, I needed, um, that help. And I also, um, cause you know, the relationships around you can suffer when you're going through the worst of it. And, um, you know, I felt bad admitting that, um, I needed that. So I, and I also had to become more secure in believing myself that I knew when I needed a break or when I needed a boundary and that was okay. Or when I even thought Sienna needed a break or needed a boundary, like I'm her mother, like I can say that I can, mm -hmm. I can do that. So it was also a long process. Just, I still don't do a great job of it today sometimes, but I catch myself. And so when I catch myself, I'm proud of myself because I'm yeah. like, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting the hang of it. And I don't need to go too far down that road. I can stop short, turn around, pivot, 
and make this uh, a little bit easier for myself. Yeah, I love that because it's it's sort of saying it, saying the the worries or anxieties aloud to yourself, because if you just sort of keep the narrative in your head, it becomes yeah. a much bigger deal or darker because you're the only one living with the thoughts and experience. So even if you were home alone and you were just saying it to yourself that this mm-hmm. is a this is a bad moment or trying to stop yourself, that the act of having that dialogue, even just with yourself aloud kind of takes the the fear out of it a little bit um, yeah. from it. I remember I heard from some, um, when I was listening to some other podcast, someone said, if you keep all of your, if the things that bring you depression or anxiety and you keep them all in the back of your mind, it's like leaving something to grow in a closet. It's dark, it's gonna fester and just grow and grow. But if you open the door and you let light into it and you talk about it, even to an empty room, the light's gonna eventually kill what's in there because yeah. you're not, in, a, in it alone anymore. And so I think that was nice that you kind of, you kind of touched on that too, of finding ways that worked for your comfort level, because some people I'm similar to you. I don't, I'm not one to just open up about my, my feelings to people just readily available. I, I'm, I like to think I'm tough enough to handle and digest everything and figure it out on my own. And, and then when I'm done with it, I'll tell somebody yeah. it was a bad time. So like you said, yeah. finding those moments of trying to stop what's bringing you that stress or sadness in those moments and then recognize, mm-hmm. okay, I'll, if yeah. I have to feel like this now I can, but I can move on from it if I need to. Yeah. I mean, also seeking out people or groups of people that are maybe going through something similar or mm-hmm. that are not on Instagram to talk <laughs> to and compare to like, I, you know, I was very fortunate where there was a mom's group at my mm-hmm. local church and just starting to hear them speak and seeing what they were going through. They weren't like, you know, this, they didn't have this aesthetically pleasing playroom, white, whatever kind of life um, going on. They had real life going on that we don't always get to see and hearing their real life and hearing that, Hey, they're stressed too, or, you know, their kids doing this too. That was a big, a big thing. And I think that can apply to, um, anybody going through an illness or such. It's it's hard for people, um, to relate to each other when they don't have experience in this situation. So I think seeking out, um, seeking out, you know, a group, whether it's through a community group or, um, you know, a a doctor's office or something like that. Um, I, I think that's helpful as well to try to find some people that you can go to, um, to hear from that aren't again, necessarily on social media. (laughs) Yes. I know we always, we always will add, we always have our disclaimer. We'll always say is that we are not, we are not a medically professionally led on nonprofit. So we do for those, we tell you to seek your advice elsewhere to those who have gone to be schooling for those areas. Yeah. Um, To be able to relate to other people. The isolation I think is what can mm -hmm. get you. It's very easy to get isolated in your um, your yucky stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. And I think something I was going to touch on too, kind of to, to end the segment was I love how you mentioned, um, when it came to talking about different situations you were dealing with when it came to your family versus friends or versus with, with Brian, your husband as well, um, that it, those were all different, they're different relationships and trying to navigate bringing up your needs or the situations that you're going through to different groups of people can, um, it's not a one size fits all we'll always say Mm -hmm. is because you'll have different bonds with different people. So have you noticed that in different dynamics, even when it came to your parents versus your siblings or your friends versus talking to Brian that you approach discussing things that if you needed support or you were trying to, reach out that hand to someone that you might have approached different types of relationships differently? Sure. I mean, I think that I feel like I'm, I'm pretty like once I make that choice to like, (laughs) I'm pretty honest, but I'm really fortunate that I have a good, like a family support system Mm -hmm. here. I I do have family that lives close by, so I'm able to lean on them. I will say, I think that in terms of my mother, uh, that's who I, I go to Mm -hmm. the most. And then, you know, sometimes with, with Brian, I'm 
trying to make sure like I'm not rocking the boat for him too much, or I don't want him to feel too much stress, which I don't think is the right approach. I'll say that like I'm saying I'm wrong. <laughs> it's probably not the right approach because, you know, when you, I think you, you should be sharing that with, um, with your husband or, or, or whatnot. And, um, you know, you have a responsibility to each other to go through things together. Um, so I was kind of approaching that the wrong way for a very long time. Um, so that definitely creates friction because here I am trying to make sure he doesn't feel any of the stress of new baby postpartum and whatnot, but that's going to create some resentment on the back end. So you need to be sharing um, as much as you can, I guess, <laughs> when you're living with day in and day out. So, um, but I, I think with my immediate family, that's who I was most open and honest with. And then I have, I really do have great friends. I had a friend who was going through kind of the same thing. Our kids were born a day apart. Oh, cool. Um, so that was good. And then, you know, and then there's some family members or some people who it, it's hard for them to, to grasp because they had a completely different experience and, you know, th and that's okay. And it's, you know, you don't want to be mad at people because they don't, they can't understand exactly what you're going through. So you don't want to get angry, but on the flip side, you do want to create good boundaries mm -hmm. with, with them as well. Um, so you know, it's, it's definitely, it, it's hard to do. I'm not going to say it's, it's easy to manage all of that. Um, but you do want to like protect your heart from hardening against anybody who doesn't react well to what you're saying or what's going on. So just like you want understanding for them, understand that, okay, they're not getting this and they don't understand this. So <laughs> we'll create some kind of boundary for the time being. Um, and then revisit it later. <laughs> yeah. And I think I loved something that you kind of, in a roundabout way pointed out was that you, when you're able to know the types of bonds or the types of relationships you have just to start with, you're able to then figure out how those people can then, you can lean on them and they can lean back mm -hmm. in different ways based on their strengths as well, or what your dynamic is, because yeah. it's, that's so important when it comes to different groups of people as well as just knowing that it's not um so much of the time everyone wants everyone to be your closest friend and the closest family member and mm -hmm. your partner's a hundred percent involved in everything but you're putting that like you said like that definitive always category on every person mm -hmm. and if they can't handle one element but they're phenomenal at 80 percent of yeah. handling the rest yeah. of your life not just to push that aside and then just only focus on that going, okay, this is just not the area that I can really divulge or deal, have them deal with. And that's, yeah. that's great. And it helps you kind of strengthen the parts of your bond that do work well. And um, especially on our, my end, having an illness as, as well, I don't have family members who have chronic illnesses. I had no, I didn't have any friends who had health issues until I launched my nonprofit was the first time I met another person who was chronically ill. So yeah. I was just kind of navigating that journey on my own until I was 23 from 16 mm -hmm. till then. Um, and the only way people could connect to me was empathizing or trying to relate to a great uncle who might've had cancer later, like 30 years prior. Um, so that was the closest I could get to them trying to understand. Um, so I kind of knew, okay, I can only get certain things out of those relationships. And similarly, yeah. it was, I was lucky that my mom is also a nurse. And so there was a, a different right. connection there um, on her end of being able to then, I utilized that, our bond in general, but then added on to that knowing, okay, she's going to be the one who can connect the most to it because she's had pa patients. Yeah. In this yeah. So it was the closest I could get to that connection for the time being. So I kind of, I joked that I kind of added all of the categories into her bucket and I said, you're going to yeah. do all of them for me. Um, exactly. I, our mamas. <laughs> I know I'm like, you can be everything at once. That's fine. Um, so, and she's always up to the, to the challenge. So, um, but, but I love that. It, like you had mentioned that too, is finding the, the ways that you can 
utilize your relationships um, to your advantage. And then it's always the flip side, I always will say is um, that I, I love you kind of pointed out that certain relationships had boundaries for just different seasons that doesn't mm-hmm. have to sustain. And I love that you pointed that out too, is um, because a lot of people worry that, oh, if I disconnect for a little bit because of what I'm dealing with now, that is like a cold sever of my friendship. No, it doesn't or a bond. Have to be. Yeah. Cause I mean, your situation is going to change mm. too. And I always just tell myself when the dust settles, like what, what, what am I going to be sorry happened? You know, yeah. so um, you don't want to shut everyone out of your life who can't quite understand 100% percent um because that wouldn't be fair either but you can say like I said you can put up little boundaries and be like all right we're not getting this um you know I'll see you next week (laughs) (laughs) I love that um and going going off of that something before we um go into something else I love which is our intermission segment which we all know is your favorite segment guys um let's be real I hear it all the time before we do that with Dina, I'm going to just always remind you guys, um, as always, because this is one of our programs that helps fund our resources we give to teens and young adults throughout the year for free every month, that we always do pop up our donate link. You'll see it on the screen. It's in our description show notes because 100% of our donations go directly towards funding all of our resources and programs that we provide every month. So zero overhead on that. Your dollars go directly towards everything we do. So we always say thank you. It keeps our lights on and our resources free for the thousands of young adults that we reach in the eight countries that connect to Invisi Youth every month. So we thank you so much for that. And now without further ado, we're going to go into my favorite segment because you all love when I take a break from talking and our guests get to take the mic. It's so that one time. (laughs) So that one time. So Dina, I'm going to relax and drink some coffee and have you tell all of our listeners and viewers a story. (laughs) A nice, long story. Now, before (laughs) I dive into the story, I had to ask, I was like, what kind of story do you want? Because I have many. Do we want like married to Jonas story? Do we want dish it girl story? (laughs) Oh, man. See, that's see, that's hard because the the 30 year old New Jersey girl in me wants to say married to Jonas. But um, because to be fair, that that's where, like I said in the beginning, that's where I first became. I was like, I like this older sister every time you would <laughs> pop on um, because so I might personally lean more towards that one. I So if you're OK with okay. that, we can lean to that one. So. I'll tell you this one big time where a lot of people will ask me, you know, is reality TV real? Like, what's that like? Like, that just seems to be like the burning question inside. They really want to know. Uh, or besides the one of like, oh, what's it like to be, you know, Kevin's sister-in-law? And I'm like, it's like, it's honestly like the most, as crazy as it sounds, it's like the most normal thing until we like maybe go to a concert once in a while. But it's like not. <laughs> normal but otherwise you know everything we're very fortunate we're a very close family and everything like I've seen his underwear on the floor you know (laughs) you know he's seen me when I just wake up in the morning because we lived with them for a year while our house was being built so that's tell you something you didn't that's that's sibling bonding at its finest right there (laughs) and you know what though like god has great timing though because it was when um valentina just danielle was pregnant with valentina and at the beginning she got really really sick and i happened to be there living with them and i was able to help out and then she had valentina and i had gotten pregnant like i think before she had Valentina because Valentina and Sienna are only like six months apart or something like that. I can't do math, but um, then I had gotten really sick. And then, so she was there (laughs) to help take care of me. So it was good. It worked out good. But what I'll tell you about reality television is it's not super duper real. Um, And I know that breaks some people's hearts and that's why it's hard for me to watch it sometimes because now I'm like, 
how much of that is a story? So actually what the producers do is they kind of get to know each one of you and like sort of kind of what's going on in your life and sort of kind of your personality. And then they pick the pieces that they want to grab onto and they create a storyline for the season. Can you imagine that? <laughs> it's a storyline. Like, so yes, everything people will say, are, are is everything you say scripted? And no, it's not, not every word that comes out of your mouth comes from a script, but before they start filming, they will say, okay, this is what's, what you guys are going to do. This is what's going to be going on. We want, they would always say, we want big, big, big reactions, big, big. And I was like, just like, come on. And I think for us, all of us at the time, and this was like eight years ago or something like that, nine years ago now, I don't even know. None of us were like sold out reality television kind of people like we all had like Katie was going to high school about to graduate to go to college I was getting my master's in, with counseling and interning during the day and then filming um at night so it wasn't really like we weren't um we weren't like totally sold out so like all the time we were just like wait a minute like I can't do that I can't say that like I have a job I'm going to or like what are my family and friends gonna think so we would weren't made for tv I don't think um <laughs> but so yeah they would and they would stop filming and say okay we really need you to do this and we really need to, you to say that and we would get so tired because it was long days that sometimes I would like turn to my sister and be like we don't argue about anything this is probably boring. I'm like, I'm pretty sure no one's going to flip a table here. Like they were on the next <laughs> network over. I was like, let's just, I'm like, I'll just tell you, I don't like the color of this and you can just be sad about it. All right. Like let's just do it. And so I need to go home. I need to study for my test the next day. So a lot of times things would happen like that, but I will say the one positive from it was we all got to go to Italy together right. as family. And that was beautiful. But before that, we had to go camping and like really like I'm talking real camping. They left us on like this little island area, <laughs> Delaware River, and some kind of bug had just hatched. Oh, and there was just swarms and swarms of this like white, but I don't even know what kind of bug it was. You couldn't even like open up your mouth without getting them in your mouth. The whole entire shoot, like two days. Oh, it was just, I've never seen anything like it. I've never had anything like this ever happen again. And we were sleeping in tents at night. And I, that night I could not sleep because all I knew was that there was just a piece of like fabric against me and like whatever wild animal <laughs> was out there. So I was laying awake all night and all of a sudden I hear something walking around the tent. Oh. I hear something like rustling and things. I hear like a jingling. I'm like, what the heck is that? So I was up all night hearing this stuff. And then the next night we see my dad's shorts from the day before, like up in the trees he had left. And they told us, don't leave any food out in the campsite, nothing, just don't leave anything out. So he had um, M&Ms in his pocket. <laughs> And that's what the jingling was, was hearing the belt on his shorts, oh like whatever it was taking his shorts up into like the woods up there because he left chocolate in his pants. So I will never camp again. <laughs> definitely I mean, not with your dad. <laughs> definitely not with my dad. Um, Katie thrives. She's like little Pocahontas <laughs> there. She's out like making fires, catching <laughs> stuff in the river. We were like, wow. <laughs> So there, there was that one time I went camping, filmed it for television and thought I was going to die. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. Oh my God. That brought, that brought, I, when you mentioned different, I was like the memories in the back of my head of watching it popped up in my head. I'm like, oh, I remember when they went there. You're like, I remember <laughs> when that was going on. Yep. That's exactly <laughs> what was happening. <laughs> oh my God. I love that. Oh man, I'm I'm excited that our fine we're gonna transition right into our final segment where I know we're gonna have just as much fun chatting with Dino. We're doing five second challenge, everyone. Five second challenge. Five second challenge. 
five second challenge. We're doing a totally new spin on an original Invisive chat session segment where you guys know, like I mentioned at the top of the show, I would not let a podcast episode go by with Dina without talking about cooking. That would have been a travesty on my end and my personal love of her Instagram feed would have not been fed. So it needed to happen. So we're going to go through some rapid questions and have Dina give us all of the cooking advice and ideas that we can think of. So the first thing I was going to ask is how, what was the, when you came, I, this is totally, it's not even on my card. I had to ask, where did the concept, the name Dish It Girl, D, Dish It Girl came from? So a while back before blogging was like really blogging, I was just writing up different restaurants I had been to. Like, that's like my hobby and different recipes that I had been doing um, and because I was going to school to get my master's in counseling, I thought of like the phrase, oh, you can dish it, but you can't take it or dishing out advice. So in my brain, I was like, <laughs> oh, dish it girl. Ha ha. But I mean, I don't know if I would choose that name now, but that's what happened years ago. So <laughs> and I, <it's> stuck. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it what? combined the counseling and the food. <laughs> It, it, it works. <laughs> it does work. The pun lands. <laughs> if I really explain it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first dish that you made that you felt you had mastered? That's a good question. You know what? I think um, my mom's sauce and the meatballs. I know that's such a basic thing to say. And then even like chicken cutlets, like the way my grandma Mm. You used to make them and they became such a staple and they are such a staple in my house. And I feel like people are always thinking it's a big deal to make sauce where to me, it's like the same as opening a jar mm -hmm. to me. Like I, that's, it's like the same amount of time and people are like, no, it's definitely not. And I don't know. That's just, <laughs> so that was like the first thing I really learned how to make was macaroni and meatballs. <laughs> I, I wrote on mine red sauce because so the Italian and me equally agree that's so, probably yeah. the sort of Bible yeah, the thing you sure. master and then like, yeah. do you have like a something you tried in the kitchen that either went like a I want to say a cooking disaster story, but something you tried that you went like, oh, this is this is not landing for me. Oh, plenty, plenty. <laughs> People think like, no, I mean, I've burnt plenty of things. Um, you know, with like the broiler, you turn it on. Like I've burnt garlic bread and like destroyed it. Um, <laughs> leaving it under the broiler too long. I would say a lot of the time when I'm testing uh doing baking, mm. I've had some really horrific fails. I was trying to make an eggnog cake. And it just, it literally it never baked. Like it just, I, I left it in there for like hours. I'm like, why won't they just bake together? I, there's, I was just missing some, some ingredient or some measurement was off and I could never get it right. So there will never be an eggnog cake, <laughs> but I did succeed in eggnog chocolate chip cookies. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. But no, it was, it was, it was terrible. And even, even with like pizza dough sometimes. Mm. It like takes forever to bake all the way through, but then the toppings get like burnt. Like, sometimes pizza drives me nuts. So I'll be honest there. <laughs> Anything with baking or dough usually makes me mad. <laughs> and total fun fact, I wanted to go to school to be a pastry chef. So that's my, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm on the opposite realm. Baking tends to be the thing that works for me. And then that's cooking, I will add yeah. too much of one thing and I can't, you can't walk it they back. Say and you're <laughs> either good at one or the other. So... Yeah, you, when you for ask, science. <laughs> uh, yeah, science is, I think it's because it's rule following that just feels like it works. Oh, <laughs> okay. That's a personality um, trait there. <laughs> but um, also, was there a recipe the first time you shared one on your blog or on your Instagram that you got like a really overwhelming feedback on that you were like, oh, wow, I wasn't expecting this out of all things to get people all really excited? All the time. This happens all the time. I, I like, I would work really hard on something made it like look like it belonged in like food and wine magazine and like <laughs> nobody would care and then I would throw a picture out of like big ZD which I feel like doesn't everybody know how to make that like people would go crazy about it so actually there are these chocolate buttercream eggs that my husband's grandmother makes there it's not even like my family recipe it's like someone else's 
And that is always the biggest hit on Pinterest and um, on my blog. It's always the biggest, biggest seller. I don't know (laughs) out of all the things I make these candy eggs. I love that you did a few weeks ago, you did some, it was tomatoes with like a warm scallion and onion oil on top of it. I've made that about five times already for every family member. I keep bringing heirloom tomatoes to everyone. I'm going, I'll make an appetizer. And my mom will laugh and be like, you're making it again. I'm like, it's so good. (laughs) (laughs) It is good. It's this, it's the silliest thing. I love making something out of nothing. I guess I say, like I find it in my fridge and I'm like, let me do this. And now you're giving me an idea for lunch. I'm like, oh, I have some cherry tomatoes and I think I have some scallions. I'm like, I think I'm going to make it that way. Thank you for that. You're now welcome. I'm starving. <laughs> Was, is there something or a type of cooking you haven't tried yet or a recipe you haven't tried that you're like, I want to try making this? 100% sushi. I've oh. made different types of Asian um, dishes um, and I'm so inspired by that cuisine. Um, I long to take a cooking class, um, that, that is more intensive when it comes to Asian flavors. Um, but sushi, I know a lot of people make it like I see it all over Instagram. There's something about, um, I, I knew that cutting raw fish a certain way, that's what made it safe, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know. There's something about it that really intimidates me and scares me. I can make cooked fish, but it's the sushi and like the raw fish. It's like, I really just want someone professional to stand in front of me and <laughs> watch me do it the first time. And then I'll feel okay. <laughs> I'm, you should, you should do that and have someone come film yourself being taught how to make, make that. First That's menu. a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> write that down. <laughs> <laughs> and is there something because you Sienna is young as well, but having a mom who cooks and tries all different recipes, was there something that was more adventurous in her palate? You were surprised she really took to right away? Um, Yeah, she loves like flounder oreganata, like a breaded flounder. Oh, wow. So like she'll, she'll eat fish. Um, She'll eat like fish and chips, like fish bites, which is really great um she loves charred broccoli she actually thinks like just plain broccoli is weird but charred broccoli (laughs) is like where it's at she's like something's wrong with this raw broccoli like you know on like (laughs) on a veggie platter I'm like no there's nothing wrong with it I'm like that's actually (laughs) the more normal everyday way to eat it Um, (laughs) so she does she likes things that have a little bit of vinegar in it. Um, she definitely surprises me, but then she also won't eat grilled cheese. So, I mean, <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> she's still a picky kid in some respects. <laughs> and then even um, the one thing I was going to ask to um, to end the segment on was for people who are just they feel like they're going to be at like a level one cooking, or they're just they want to try, but they feel like oh, if I start to fail, I'm not going to be able to figure it out on my own. What are, what's like a piece of advice that you would give to people who want to try being able to cook on their own or be cooking and not ordering as much? You just have to start. Um, I, I taught, I mean, I'm not a classically trained chef at all. So mine was just an interest in food and wanting to eat. Yes. A lot of it came from my parents and my mom, but I really just learned from watching the food network and following recipes, mm. um, on my own. And it was a lot of trial and error. Like I said, I've, I've burnt a lot, a lot of things <laughs> in my time. And I would start really simple with things, you know, you do like, like, don't try to like debone a, a, a duck or something or a fish <laughs> or like, you know, spatchcock a chicken with your first recipe. Start with some things that are a little bit simpler. Like if you've never cracked an egg before, make an egg, you, you know, yeah. crack the egg, make the egg, boil water, put pasta in the water, <laughs> you know, start with <laughs> like really simple things. Um, make a salad dressing. Mm. That's always the best when you, it's like, when you make a salad dressing from scratch, you feel like what you did. So yeah. <laughs> give little things that make yourself really confident 
first. I love that because that's the whole thing in the kitchen is to have some independence, but have gain some confidence in a. And it's fun to take some classes. There's classes everywhere. They're fun to do for like a girls' night, Mm -hmm. or you know, if your birthday's coming up, like there. Nobody never, nobody's ever not having fun at a cooking class. So I've gone to one of yours. So (laughs) true. (laughs) My mom and sister is a Mother's Day. Yeah, that was so nice. That was really nice. That was a good one. Um, yeah. So do do things like that. Um, but start start small, start simple. And when you have those small wins, you'll be encouraged to do the next one. I love that's such a good piece of advice to end the episode on. And I had so much fun getting to have you on the episode, Dina. It was an absolute blast. And I want to make sure other people can find you since I've been hyping up this tomato re- recipe <laughs> reel, they now need to find it. So where can people find you on social media and everywhere else? Sure. So you can find a lot of my recipes on my website, dishagirl.com. You can subscribe to the newsletter there, which will give you all the updates on new recipes coming out um, and just any any different speaking engagements or television appearances, you'll be the first to know that. And then of course, on Instagram at Dish It Girl Dina, you could see all those fun reels and behind the scenes. And you can see when I burn something for sure. <laughs> <on my stories. laughs> I love that. And yet again, like always, everybody, I tell you, Invisi Youth, you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at Invisi Youth and Invisi Youth Chat Sessions is on where all podcast platforms are. So if you can subscribe and give that thumbs up like button, that definitely helps keep us going. So thank you again, Dina. I had so much fun on the episode with you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was nice to talk with you again, Dominique. Oh, thank you so much. And everyone, I will speak to all of you soon. Bye, everybody.